Prologue Part 4.2 Force Over Law Hello and welcome back to 202 Decades of Western History. A note on the show before I get started. I know I said previously that I was splitting the prologue episode on Rome into two parts. Well, I was overly optimistic. I thought I could get from the Second Punic War to Emperor Augustus in less time than it took to get from the founding of Rome to the First Punic War. It turns out I was very wrong. The transcript for the last 218 years of the Republic is over twice as long as the prior 500 years. So, instead of two episodes on the Roman Republic, we now have three. But I can promise it will stop there, and there will be less delay than last time. The transcript is finished. Last time we watched as Rome was founded as another small kingdom on the Italian peninsula, we saw it struggle and rise above its neighbors, distinguishing itself through ingenuity and grit. Rome survived the challenge of first the Latins, then the Etruscans, then the Samnites, slowly expanding in territory and power. We saw Rome endure and outlast the invasion of a Greek army under Pyrrhus. And we saw Rome engage in a decade-long war with Carthage for control of the western Mediterranean. Rome had won, but that was merely the first round of the fight. Both sides would stand in the ring face-to-face -face again before long. During the brief interlude between the First and Second Punic Wars, Rome was kept busy with outside threats. With increased trade brought about by victory over Carthage in the First Punic War, the situation to the east in the Adriatic became untenable. There, pirates under the employ of Queen Tuta of the Illyrian Kingdom of Ardii had become increasingly bold and were disrupting Roman trade. The Illyrians lived in modern Croatia, Bosnia, and northern Albania. A Roman army was sent to Illyria and quickly stamped out the piracy. They also freed several Greek cities which had been under Illyrian rule and placed them under the protection of Rome. While still technically free cities, this was Rome's first toehold into the eastern Mediterranean. The powers of the east watched warily. At the same time, Rome dealt with another invasion of Celts from the north. The haunting memory of the Gallic sack of Rome 150 years earlier motivated them to take this incursion seriously. Along with their Italian allies, they gathered a huge army and managed to drive off the invaders. On the heels of this victory, they freed the Po Valley from the Gauls, who had ruled the area for the past several centuries. Spinning from wars in the east to wars in the north, Roman attention was soon pulled to the west. The First Punic War had begun in Sicily. The second began in Iberia. This region, which today is split between Spain and Portugal, was called Hispania by the Romans. After losing their possessions on Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica, Carthage had expanded up the coast of Iberia. With its focus purely on mercantilism, rather than maintaining an army, Carthage had managed to raise enough funds to pay off its massive reparations to Rome early. In Hispania, Hannibal and his brother Hasdrubal, sons of the old general Hamilcar, had led much of the expansion. This was the family that had sworn an oath of eternal hatred for Rome. They founded New Carthage in southern Hispania as their capital there, and had gathered local troops, whipping them into an effective and disciplined army. This rapid expansion worried the Romans. To prevent further expansion of Carthaginian power, they made a new treaty with them. The two powers had agreed upon the Ebro River as the dividing line. Carthage would have free reign south of the river, but wouldn't expand further north, and Rome wouldn't meddle south of it. It seems clear enough, but the situation on the ground was a bit tricky. The issue was that the city of Saguntum was a Roman ally, and south of the river. In 219, Hannibal besieged Saguntum, and the city called for Roman aid. This news caused the Senate to debate on the course of action they should take. The war party won, and they finally responded to Carthage's growing power in Hispania. Early the next year, Rome declared war on Carthage. The Second Punic War had begun. The Roman plan was to send an army to Iberia under Publius Scipio and send an army to Africa under Sempronius Longus. Before Rome could seize the initiative, though, something happened the Romans never expected. Hannibal immediately gathered his army and began marching north from New Carthage, up through Iberia, 
with him at the start of his march were as many as 90,000 infantry and 12,000 cavalry. Hannibal was heading for Italy. He crossed the Pyrenees with a smaller corps of his army and entered what's now southern France, staying inland to avoid Gallic tribes allied with Rome. At the same time, the Roman army bound for Iberia landed at Massalia, which is modern Marseille in France, and began to march southwest. Hannibal deftly avoided them. His approach was completely unnoticed by the Romans. This didn't mean it was easy going, though. The Gauls were not going to let his large army pass through unbothered. His army was constantly harassed. But at a crossing of the Rhone River, he defeated an army of Gauls and kept marching east. Hannibal and his army were now racing against the onset of winter. Only one barrier stood between them and Italy, the Alps. And if they didn't cross these mountains before the snows of winter set in, they would have to wait until spring, giving the Romans an opportunity to discover and prepare for the invasion. At the base of the mountains, he sent more of his army home. Only the elite and loyal corps remained. Hannibal's crossing of the Alps is the stuff of legend. Not only was the march treacherous and cold, but the local tribes did their best to make it harder. Hannibal's army was ambushed several times, and the historian Polybius records that the army had to be on constant lookout for massive boulders being pushed down the hillside, aimed to smash into the men or the beasts. The beasts should be noted too. 37 war elephants began the march up the mountains, and somehow, most of them survived the cold and the narrow paths. Historians aren't exactly sure which paths Hannibal took. At the summit, though, they had to march through snowbanks left over from the previous winter. Before heading down again, they rested a couple days. The descent was just as arduous as the climb had been. Men and animals lost their footing and fell to their deaths. It was November now, and before they reached the valley, snow began to fall, making each step more dangerous. After 15 days in the mountains, and after five months of marching since leaving New Carthage, Hannibal's army was finally in Italy. The Romans, for their part, still had no idea of the army that approached in their own backyard. They'd even gone into their winter quarters. Slowly, though, a horrible whisper began to spread of a ghastly army up in the mountains. The tale was unbelievable at first, but as the days passed, more reports began to come in. A Carthaginian army was in Italy. Hannibal's army quickly captured a city near modern Turin and used this as their temporary base. Late in the month, at the Battle of Ticinius, the Romans faced the Carthaginians for the first time on Italian soil. Publius Scipio, the general we just mentioned who had landed his army in Massalia and just missed the Carthaginian army, had by now caught on to Hannibal's movements. He sent his brother on to Hispania with the army, but he personally sailed back to Italy to lead a stand against the invaders. It was he who now commanded the first line of Roman defense. The small battle that took place was a hasty one, with mostly light infantry and cavalry engaged in the fighting. Hannibal's cavalry was from Numidia, a region of North Africa west of Carthage, in modern Algeria. These horsemen outclassed any of the cavalry that Rome could field. The small force of Romans was routed and fled. So much for home field advantage. Instead of being proactive, Rome was now forced to be reactive. Sempronius Longus, the general who had been in Sicily preparing his army for an invasion of Africa, was suddenly recalled and sent north to help Publius Scipio's defense. A month later, now in the depths of winter, Hannibal succeeded in luring Longus's army into a battlefield of his choosing. This was the Battle of the Trebia. As the battle began, the Numidian cavalry defeated the outnumbered Roman cavalry. They were now free to join up with the light infantry and flank the Romans. The final blow came when a force of Carthaginians, who had been hiding in reserve, appeared and slammed into the back of the Roman lines. Of the 40,000 soldiers, all but 10,000 were killed or captured. Sempronius Longus led these survivors in an ordered retreat to a nearby defensible city. This huge defeat for the Romans convinced the Gauls and Ligurians that Hannibal was for real. They allied with him, growing his army to over 60,000 men. The people of Rome went into a panic when they heard their army had been destroyed. Only the appearance of Sempronius marching his haggard forces back to the city was able to calm things a little. The Romans took away the same lesson that the Gauls and Ligurians had. It was time to take Hannibal seriously. 
They recruited more soldiers and built 60 new ships to fend off potential Carthaginian attacks by sea. No one was better at reloading after a defeat than the Romans, so despite their loss and initial panic, they weathered the winter well enough. When spring arrived, Hannibal was on the move again. Two Roman armies, one led by Flaminius, the other by Servilius, were blocking each path towards central Italy. Hannibal's army chose neither option, though, and instead passed into the marshes of the Arno, bypassing the two armies. But this path through the swamp was nearly as rough as the crossing of the Alps. The men sloshed for four days through the fly and midge-infested swamp, with no dry land to rest on. Hannibal himself lost an eye from an infection during the crossing. Many of his men lost much more than an eye. Finally on dry ground again, Hannibal crossed unopposed over the Apennines and entered Etruria. He had dodged the two armies standing in his way. The army of Carthage began to ravage the countryside under Flaminius's supposed protection to draw the general out into a fight. And Flaminius went with his army to check their movements. But Flaminius wouldn't be drawn into a fight yet. Trying a new tactic, Hannibal wheeled his army and marched around Flaminius and now moved between him and Rome. Finally, Flaminius was provoked to do something, as he led his army around the edge of Lake Trasimene, on the narrow shore under the hill, the Carthaginians rushed down the slopes, trapping the marching line of Romans against the lake. All 25,000 of the Romans, including Flaminius, were killed. No army stood between Hannibal and Rome, but without siege equipment, he knew he couldn't take the city. He marched south into central and southern Italy. His strategy wasn't merely to defeat the Romans on the battlefield. He would need support. He hoped to peel off the Greek cities and the other Italians to his side, just as he had done with the Gauls and the Ligurians in the north. The plan wasn't far-fetched. Each city would have seen that this might be their chance to finally break free from Roman rule. The risk, though, was in facing the wrath of the Romans if Hannibal failed at totally destroying them. In Rome itself, the Senate was desperate enough to appoint a dictator, something not done for many decades. They chose Quintus Fabius Maximus. He gathered an army and marched into the field. But, unlike his predecessors, Fabius didn't engage Hannibal in a battle. Instead of directly fighting Hannibal, Fabius' army shadowed the Carthaginian, picking off scouts and generally harassing them from a distance. Hannibal tried several times to lure Fabius into a trap or even a battle, but each time Fabius was too cautious and he always slipped away. On one hand, Hannibal was now free to ravage Apulia without a Roman army stopping him. On the other hand, the presence of a Roman army in the field for months at a time, without it being annihilated, did a great deal to still the worst fears of the citizens and the Senate. Still, it was against Roman nature not to confront their foes head-on, and Fabius quickly became unpopular. With the massive Roman defeats already fading into memory, some began to whisper that Fabius was drawing out the war, and a better general would have crushed Hannibal by now. When new consuls were elected in 216, leaders advocating a more aggressive approach were chosen. First, there was Varro, who was itching for a fight. And then there was Paulus, who was more moderate and looked to employ a few of Fabius' tactics. That spring, Hannibal seized a Roman supply depot at Cannae in Apulia. The consuls together raised an immense army of 86,000, the largest army yet fielded by the Romans, and went out to meet him. When both consuls were together on a battlefield, command of the army could either be split in half, or total command could be alternated day after day. Paulus was hesitant to directly engage, but it was Varro's day of command, and he lined up his huge forces and met the Carthaginians in battle. Hannibal's army was arrayed in a funny manner. Instead of a straight line, the center of his line was forward of the wings. In this center weren't his best troops, but lighter infantry. The Romans noticed this and expected to break Hannibal's army apart. As the two sides met, the Roman center quickly began to push back the weaker enemy center. What they didn't notice, though, was that as they pushed the center farther and farther back, the Carthaginian wings were standing their ground. Soon, the legions at the center of the army were far forward of the wings. Though the center fell back, the line did not break. The Carthaginian army was now bent into a semicircle around the Roman army. The mass of Roman infantry was stuck in the middle without being able to contribute to the fight. This is when Hannibal sprung his trap 
his Numidian cavalry on the wings defeated or drove off the Roman cavalry, and then swung around behind the Romans and completed the encirclement. The Romans were now totally surrounded, being pressed in from all sides. Many of the soldiers were packed so tightly they couldn't even lift their arms to defend themselves. In a brutal slaughter, they were cut down, almost to a man. The consul Paulus died there with his men. While around 15,000 managed to escape, the defeat is one of the most total and devastating defeats in military history. Military strategists today still study Hannibal's tactics. The historian Livy writes, Never when the city was in safety was there so great a panic and confusion within the walls of Rome. The consul and his army, having been lost at the Trasiminus the year before, it was not one wound upon another which was announced, but a multiplied disaster. The loss of two consular armies, together with two consuls, and that now there was neither any Roman camp, nor general, nor soldiery. That Apulia and Samnium, and now almost the whole of Italy, were in the possession of Hannibal. No other nation, surely, would not have been overwhelmed by such an accumulation of misfortune. With Rome's armies destroyed, now was Hannibal's chance. He advanced on Rome, unopposed, captured the city, and completely destroyed it, executing the Senate and selling the surviving citizens into... S What's that? He didn't what? He didn't go straight for Rome. Huh. That must have been a different timeline. In reality, Hannibal hesitated. No army stood between him and Rome, but still, he wasn't sure he had the numbers to besiege the city. Anyway, his plan from the start wasn't to destroy Rome itself, but to beat the armies on the battlefield and convince the other cities of Italy to abandon her. And after Cannae, this seemed to finally be happening. Several cities in Magna Graecia abandoned the Romans and allied with Carthage. Most significant, though, was when Capua allied with Carthage. By this time, Capua had become the second city of Italy, and this seemed to be a huge blow for Rome. The first wave of a flood of cities turning away from the Romans. While much of southern Italy did turn away, central Italy stuck with Rome. The Romans, for their part, did what they always did. They gathered another army. This time, though, they had to stretch things. The age requirements were relaxed, and even prisoners and slaves were recruited. By the next year, in 215, 12 legions had been raised. From here, the war in Italy moved into a stagnant phase. Hannibal captured cities and defeated small Roman detachments, but the Romans retook the cities once Hannibal moved on, and they constantly harassed his army, whittling it down through attrition. The more allies Hannibal gained, the more easy targets were available for the Romans to defeat. For eleven more years, Hannibal marched through Italy, never able to be defeated, never able to knock out the Romans. The Second Punic War was not limited to Italy. Meanwhile, in Hispania and Macedonia, events were taking place that would shape the future of the war and the Mediterranean. In Hispania, the army that had narrowly missed the Carthaginians as they passed by had entered the peninsula and gained support from some local tribes. The Romans set up shop between the Ebro River and the Pyrenees Mountains. They blocked the easiest route to Italy and made it difficult for reinforcements to travel over to Hannibal. The brother of Hannibal, Hasdrubal, was still in New Carthage, which is modern Cartagena, Spain, and in 215 he set out to march to Italy to join with his brother. Maybe with their combined armies they would have the numbers to capture Rome. Hasdrubal met the Roman army that was trying to keep him contained in the Battle of Dertosa. The tactics were similar to those that Hannibal had used in Cannae, but this time the Romans pushed all the way through the Carthaginian center and cut their army in half, defeating each portion. Things seemed to be going well for the Romans in Iberia, but in 211 the Romans noticed the Carthaginian army was split into three separate sections far from each other. The Romans split their own army to defeat each section at once. In the two battles that followed, though, the Romans were soundly defeated. Hasdrubal had bribed the Roman mercenaries to desert them when the battle started. It was back to square one in Iberia. Hasdrubal couldn't break out, and the Romans were limited to their northeast corner of the peninsula. In 210, reinforcements arrived in Iberia, led by a new commander, Publius Cornelius Scipio. While previously the war in Iberia had been a stalemate for years, 
this young Scipio turned things around almost immediately. The year after he arrived, he managed to capture New Carthage. While his predecessors had first been unable to pin down Hasdrubal and later were crushed by him, Scipio was finally able to catch Hasdrubal and defeat his army. In this defeat, though, Hasdrubal escaped with an intact core of his army. While the Romans blocked the easiest way out of Iberia into what is now France, this brother of Hannibal was now able to slip out of Iberia by taking the long way out, crossing the Pyrenees at their western end in what is now the Basque country of Spain. Now that he was out of Iberia, Hasdrubal made a beeline for the Alps. He reached them and crossed the mountains, following the path his brother Hannibal had taken years earlier. Instead of being opposed by the local Celts, now many of them joined his army. Even with him bringing more war elephants over the mountains, Hasdrubal's army made much better time due to the constructions and clearings Hannibal's army had made to make a path. A second Carthaginian army was now in Italy. If the two linked up, they would finally have the numbers to crush the city of Rome itself. This may not have been Hannibal's original plan, but after years of trying to flip the cities of Italy against the Romans, he must have begun to see his plan falling apart. Capua coming to his side was not the beginning of more cities, but merely the high water mark of Roman resistance. Capua itself had already been recaptured by the Romans and stripped of all its autonomy by the time Hannibal's brother reached the peninsula. Camped in the north of Italy, in the shadows of the Alps, Hasdrubal sent a letter to his brother with a location to meet up, but the letter was intercepted. Instead of Hannibal's arrival, two Roman armies came north, and together they crushed Hasdrubal between the two of them. Hasdrubal himself died in the fray. The Romans sent his head in a bag to Hannibal, who until that moment had been unaware of his brother's arrival. No help was coming for him. He must have burned with anger as he watched his hopes crushed before him. No help came from his mother city either. For years now, he had begged Carthage for support, but little ever arrived. Without a clear path of approach, Carthage could never be sure what they sent would arrive in Italy. Still, Hannibal had sworn an oath of eternal hatred toward Rome, so he could only fight on. The death of Hasdrubal not only secured the safety of Rome, it also ensured Rome's dominance in Iberia. Without their charismatic leader, Scipio made quick work of the rest of the war there. While the war in Spain wrapped up, another theater of the war on the opposite side of the Mediterranean was also coming to a close. In 215, not long after Cannae, when Hannibal's stock was at its highest, Philip V, the Antigonid king of Macedonia and most of Greece, agreed upon an alliance with Hannibal against Rome. Philip feared the new Roman foothold on the Greek side of the Adriatic, that it wouldn't stay only a foothold for long. The Romans were wary too, because this alliance now posed a threat of a Macedonian army entering Italy and joining Hannibal. The Romans sent a legion to guard the crossing and strengthen the ships guarding the straits. They were allied with the Aetolian League, a group of cities just across the Gulf of Corinth from the Peloponnesian Peninsula in Greece. The Aetolian League appreciated the mollifying effect that the Roman foothold had on Philip V of Macedon, and they agreed to help the Romans. Anytime Philip began to head with his army toward Roman holdings, the Aetolian League would attack and make enough trouble for Philip that he would have to turn around to face them. The Macedonian king never was able to help Hannibal. In 205, Rome and Macedon agreed to a peace. The year prior, in 206 BC, Scipio had sealed the Roman victory over Carthage in Iberia. His army of 48,000 had defeated a Carthaginian army of over 54,000. Following the battle, the last Carthaginian city in Iberia defected to the Romans. With the Iberian front concluded, the time was ripe to wrap up the war. Still too scarred from their defeats by Hannibal a decade ago to directly attempt to destroy him, the Romans chose a new strategy to rid him from Italy. While Hannibal was bottled up in the south, Scipio was given command of the armies in Sicily and began to prepare for an invasion of Africa. The Romans hadn't been alone in fighting on several fronts. Obviously Hannibal fought in Italy, and we talked about the war in Iberia, 
but the Carthaginians also had to fight against their neighbors in North Africa. In 213, a Numidian king had declared for Rome to free his people from Carthage's rule. Soldiers had to be brought to North Africa from Spain. The various Numidian polities divided amongst themselves who they would support. An important name for later in this episode is Massinissa, who led a Numidian coalition allied with Rome. Anyway, in 204, Scipio landed his veteran army northwest of Carthage, near Utica. The Romans had almost captured the city when Syphax, the most powerful Numidian supporter of Carthage, arrived. The siege had to be lifted. The Roman army was now camped near the combined Carthaginian and Numidian army. As night fell, Scipio sent a force of men to the top of a hill near the Carthaginians to draw their attention there. Their guard kept watch in this direction. Meanwhile, Scipio led his main force around the enemy and attacked the enemy camp late at night, setting fire to it. The soldiers flew into a panic when the Romans' attack began. More than 40,000 were killed. Dishonorable? Sure. But Scipio's bet had paid off. Syphax and his Numidian troops had escaped the battle alive, though, and Scipio sent his generals Laelius and Massinissa with a force after him. At the city of Sirta, the Numidians led by Massinissa, with Roman help, defeated the Numidians led by Syphax, capturing him and hauling him off to Rome. Building upon this victory, Massinissa made himself the sole ruler of Numidia. Rome now had a strong ally, who could ensure a superiority of cavalry. Meanwhile, Carthage's best general was puttering away the years in the boot of Italy, making less and less progress. With Carthage short on allies and facing a veteran army, Hannibal had to be recalled home. At the same time, peace negotiations were begun between Carthage and Rome. It had been a long war, and the terms offered by Rome were not overly harsh. But with hopes lifted after Hannibal returned home, and because of a lack of trust of the Romans, Carthage reneged on the agreement. The war would have to reach a violent conclusion. With Hannibal and Scipio both on African soil, the wait would be short. The two sides met in the Battle of Zama. Unlike previous battles, the Romans had the advantage in cavalry, while the Carthaginians had more infantry. They also had 80 war elephants. Scipio and the Romans by now were prepared for them, though. The two sides lined up, and the battle began with an elephant charge. The goal was for the elephants to plow into the Roman lines and break up their formations. But the flexibility of the Roman manipul system allowed Scipio to instruct his men to make lanes for the elephants, and rather than crashing, they passed right by the front lines and were met with trumpeters and lancers in the back who could deal with them. Next, the cavalry on each wing charged into each other, but the superior Numidian cavalry employed by the Romans soon got the better of their foes and pursued them off the battlefield. The infantry met, and the more experienced Romans began to gain the advantage. Hannibal's first two lines were falling apart, and the final line, which had been held in reserve to prevent a Roman encirclement, had to be sent forward into the fray. Both sides' formations now devolved into straight lines, engaging each other head-on. The fighting dragged on in this manner until the Roman cavalry was able to return to the battlefield and charge into the rear of the Carthaginians, destroying them. After more than 16 years of fighting, Hannibal, who had been invincible in Italy, had now been defeated by the Romans, no, by Scipio, in Africa. Maybe he had lost his edge, or maybe Scipio was the real deal. Either way, Carthage could not fight on. The city sued for peace, under any conditions, and they would be harsh. The treaty ensured the loss of Carthage's empire and placed such a huge indemnity on her that she would surely never rise again. Carthage was forbidden from having war elephants or fielding more than ten warships. She could only fight wars in Africa and then only with Roman permission. Rome gained permanent control of Sicily and Spain, never again to fall into Carthaginian hands. Scipio was an instant hero. Not only was he given a lavish triumph on his return to Rome, but a triumphal arch was built to commemorate his victory, and he was given the moniker Africanus in recognition of his accomplishments. Scipio Africanus goes down on the short list of greatest Romans ever.
Hannibal's story isn't our focus, but I have to share a little of his later life. Hannibal led the city of Carthage for several years after the war. He was successful too. He limited the power of the aristocracy and performed an audit that allowed the city to pay for the massive reparations without increasing taxes. Under his rule, the defeated city quickly became prosperous again. Rome wasn't pleased with that though, and they were upset by communications they had intercepted between Hannibal and Antiochus, the Seleucid king, who loomed as the greatest threat to Roman power in the east. The party in Carthage opposed to him had also begun to plot to remove him. Seeing the rope tighten around his neck, Hannibal voluntarily went into exile. First, he fled to Tyre, the ancient mother city of Carthage, and then to Ephesus in Anatolia, to the court of Antiochus. Hannibal no longer led Carthage, but his oath of hatred toward Rome was undying. The Battle of Zama would not be the last time Rome faced a force led by Hannibal. No other power remained to face the Romans in the western Mediterranean Sea. Now, the hungry gaze of Rome looked to the east. The Senate had not forgotten that in Rome's darkest hour, Philip V of Macedonia had allied with Hannibal against Rome. We'll cover this war more quickly than the Second Punic War. This was a war of expanding influence for Rome, rather than an existential threat as Hannibal had been. After the death of the Ptolemaic king of Egypt, Philip V and the Seleucid king made an agreement to peel off some of the Ptolemy's territories for themselves. In these actions, they engaged the independent city-states of Rhodes, an island in the Aegean Sea, and Pergabum, a rich kingdom in the northwest corner of Anatolia along the sea. These two city-states called on the Romans for help. Remembering Philip's alliance against them, Rome sent advisors to survey things, and then finally sent an army. They demanded Philip not make any moves against the other cities of Greece. Philip wouldn't agree to this, instead attacking Athens, leading Rome to declare war. Rome was supported by their allies, the Aetolian League, and Rhodes and Pergamum, of course. After much maneuvering, Philip met the Romans in Thessaly in the Battle of Sinocephali in 197 BC. Heavy rains the evening before brought a heavy fog onto the battlefield. A battle began when Roman scouts bumped into some of Philip's army up on a hillside. Skirmishing took place, and the consul Flaminius sent more soldiers in to help. Philip now sent in his phalanx to end the skirmish, which was quickly turning into a full battle. The phalanx formation was nearly unstoppable when on the flat, even ground and running directly into an opposing line, but on hillsides and uneven ground, the phalanx had difficulty staying in formation, and when a formation fell apart, the soldiers with their unwieldy six-meter-long spears were no good in a man-to-man -man fight. Although the Macedonians controlled the higher ground, the greater flexibility and adaptability of the Roman legions allowed them to overcome the phalanx and attack them from the rear. Philip was decisively defeated. The war was over, and Philip was forced to sign a treaty of alliance with Rome, agreeing not to attack the other cities of Greece. These other cities were essentially placed under Roman protection. While little territory had changed for Rome, she now had her hands deep into the politics of the Greek world. Each city was to be free from outside rule, from Macedon, from the leagues, and even from Roman tribute. A pretty sweet deal for the cities of Greece, but too sweet for the Aetolian League. They had seen the small cities under their power stripped from them by their ostensible ally. The sulking Aetolian League reached out to Antiochus of the Seleucids, the successor state to Alexander's empire that controlled the east, Babylon, Syria, and much of Anatolia. Antiochus was riding high after victories in the east and decided the request from the Aetolian League would be the perfect casus belli to expand his kingdom into Greece. Rome's ally in Anatolia, Pergamum, caught wind of this and called for help. Scipio Africanus and his brother Lucius led the first Roman army onto the Asian continent. At the Battle of Magnesia, the Romans were outnumbered two to one, but were able to crush the Seleucid horde. The treaty afterward kicked the Seleucids out of any territory west of the Taurus Mountains, essentially kicking them out of modern Turkey. 
the Roman allies Pergamum and Rhodes were given much of the territory. Among the agreements in the treaty was that Antiochus was to hand over Hannibal to Rome. Hannibal had actually been engaged in anti-Roman naval skirmishes over the past decade in support of Antiochus. Now, though, the noose grew tighter once again for the old general, and he decided to slip away before he could be handed over to his sworn nemesis. He ran again and made it to Bithynia, a remote Greek kingdom on the north coast of Anatolia, along the Black Sea. Here he lived for several years. The Bithynians were enemies of Pergamum. Finally, though, Hannibal's luck ran out, and he couldn't slip away again. The Romans had tracked him down and surrounded his home. He took poison rather than being captured and taken back as a show thing to Rome. He said, Let us relieve the Romans from the anxiety they have so long experienced, since they think it tries their patience too much to wait for an old man's death. Thirty-five years after leading his army across the Alps into Italy, at the age of sixty-seven, far from the Mediterranean sun of his homeland, along the dreary coast of the Black Sea, Hannibal passed away. Back in Africa, the old ally of Rome, Massinissa, was still kicking. The old king would live to be 90 years old, and long kept his health and vigor. Since Rome had demanded Carthage to only engage in warfare approved by Rome, the Numidians were free to raid and nibble away the territory of Carthage without consequences. Nearly all of the old Carthaginian coast of Africa had been seized by the Numidians. Whenever Carthage appealed to Rome for justice, their requests were dismissed. Fifty years had now passed since the Battle of Zama, and when they paid the final installment of her huge reparation payments to Rome, Carthage considered herself finally free from the shackles placed by the treaty. Carthage declared war on Numidia. For the past few decades, the statesman Cato the Elder had concluded all his speeches with Ceterem senso delendum esse Carthaginem, meaning, besides, I think that Carthage must be destroyed. The Senate surely didn't see what had been reduced to the city-state of Carthage as a real threat, but many must have seen the rich agricultural lands of North Africa and imagined the gold coins in their hands. So, when Carthage declared war on Numidia, Rome declared war on Carthage. At the same time the Carthaginians learned that Rome had declared war on them, they learned an invasion force had already set sail. They had a tiny army, a tiny navy, and no allies. Even the nearby city of Utica had declared against them to gain favor with Rome. Carthage immediately sued for peace. Rome's demands were extreme. First, Carthage was asked to deliver 300 hostages, children of the nobility, into Roman custody. Desperate, the Carthaginians agreed. Next, the Romans required that the city of Carthage itself be abandoned and its inhabitants move 10 miles inland. Even without a hope for defending themselves, this request was too much. The sea was the lifeblood of Carthage. They could not abandon their home. So despite being surrounded by enemies, with little real army, the citizens of Carthage rejected Rome's demands and began to prepare a defense for a siege. The Romans cut off the city by land and sea and repeatedly attempted to break into the city. But the desperation of the Carthaginians gave them strength and led them to a heroic last stand. The siege lasted three years before the Romans made it into the city in 146 BC. Even then, there was fighting in the streets for several days. Most of the citizens were slaughtered. The rest were enslaved. The city was burned and torn down, and the fields in the hinterlands were plowed and sown with salt. Finally, a formal curse was laid upon the site where Carthage once laid. Carthage was no more. It had been wiped from the earth. The city's destruction is morally indefensible. Carthage had agreed to Rome's terms, suffered under her unjust arbitration for half a century, and had done nothing deserving annihilation. Naked greed, hate, ambition, and a dash of fearful memories had combined to poison the Senate. Pure imperialism now ruled the Romans. This moral black mark on Rome's reputation wouldn't be the last, not even the last for the year. That same year, Rome also destroyed the city of Corinth in Greece. 
Since the end of the Second Macedonian War and the defeat of the Seleucids in the Battle of Magnesia, the Romans had increasingly expanded their power over mainland Greece. In the Third Macedonian War, the Romans overcame Perseus, the ambitious son of Philip V, who had tried to rid Greece from the influence of Rome. The Romans had defeated him and split Macedonia into several smaller client kingdoms. Perseus was captured and brought before the crowds in Rome. He spent the rest of his life a prisoner. Rather than simply serving as protector of Greece, Rome now had indirect rule there. About two decades later, in 150 BC, a man named Andriscus appeared, claiming to be a lost son of Perseus. There had been peace for almost 20 years under Roman oversight in Greece. The arrival of Andriscus, though, threw Greece into rebellion. The man is widely viewed to be a pretender, but he was a unifying force for divided Macedonia, eager to renew its power. Andriscus was initially successful in uniting Macedonia under his rule and throwing out Roman garrisons. When a Roman army was sent to deal with this pretender, Andriscus' growing support gave him an army larger than the Roman army sent against him had expected. The legion was destroyed, and the commander was killed. This victory against the Romans gave Andriscus legitimacy and admiration. Much of Greece declared for him. He had done what no Greek army had managed to do before, defeat a Roman army in Greece. For Rome, it was a wake-up call. Despite the contemporary hostilities against Carthage, a full consular army was sent. In the next battle, Andriscus was defeated. Like the man he claimed was his father, he was captured and hauled back to Rome. However, after being paraded through the streets, he wasn't jailed, but executed. After this fourth Macedonian War, the Senate saw that their hands-off approach to ruling Greece wasn't sustainable. Macedonia, along with Epirus and much of Illyria, were annexed as a new province, and a legion was permanently stationed there. In what everyone at the time knew was a suicidal war, the Achaean League in the Peloponnese declared war on Rome. Up to this point in Greece, the Romans had only been at war with Macedonia, and with their smaller numbers and the legion's consistent superiority over the Greek phalanx, the Achaean cause, inspired by demagoguery, was hopeless from the start. Rome made quick work of them. As an example to prevent future rebellions, the Romans sacked Corinth, the head city of the Achaean League. Much of the population had fled, but of those who remained, every man was killed, and every woman and child was sold into slavery. The city was stripped of its wealth, and its art was taken back to Rome. Finally, the city itself was destroyed. Corinth and Carthage smoldered together as twin pillars of smoke rising from opposite sides of the Mediterranean. The small republic founded in Latium now covered south and east Iberia, all of Italy, north Africa and modern Tunisia and Algeria, all of Greece, and some of Albania and European Turkey. The republic stretched nearly all the way around the Mediterranean. Civil Unrest Decade after decade of war and conquest had reshaped the Roman Republic. The system built around the city-state of Rome and then expanded to include the other Latins began to strain as it governed nearly the whole of the Mediterranean. In times past, the Romans had prided themselves on their hardiness, frugality, and austerity. The expansion, though, had lined the pockets of the rich. They now lived lives of cultured luxury. Greek philosophy, art, and dress were imported. Many a conservative would have balked at the loss of Rome's old virtues, giving way to eastern softness. Life for the independent land-owning farmers, who had formed the backbone of the Roman state since its foundation, had not improved with the growth and size of the republic or the growth and wealth of the rich. As the rich grew richer, the small farmers could no longer compete with what could almost be called factory farms, run from Sicily or Campania or Iberia, and increasingly North Africa. Much of the labor of these farms would have been done by slaves. When it came time for these farmers to serve in the army, they were no longer gone for a few weeks on a campaign 50 miles away in Samnium. Now they may spend several months or years away in Spain or Greece or wherever while their fields sat fallow. 
How is a small farmer to compete with the efficiency or scale of the rich? Increasingly, the people in the middle were being squeezed into destitution. There had always been a land requirement to serve in the legions, but fewer and fewer Roman citizens were able to meet the standard. As the independent farmers were undercut by the slave-run plantations called latifundias, many had to sell their small plots. And who would they sell to but to an already rich neighbor, who likely was buying up nearby farms left and right? The problem was severe enough that the amount of property required to serve in the legions was lessened, but the drafts were still coming up short. In these conditions, people were driven into poverty. Many did what people have always done, fled to the city in hopes of a better life. Rome itself swelled in size. Its streets became filled with cramped tenement houses reaching up to five stories tall. Some found jobs as salesmen or craftsmen, sure. Many others fell into a client system wherein they received charity from a rich benefactor with the expectation of support. This client system would see powerful people develop what were essentially gangs or mafias of supporters who could be used to carry out the leader's will. Conditions were ripe for unrest and civil conflict. This is usually the part of any Roman history where we begin to talk in depth about a series of, quote, great men who led the Republic down the path of empire. Names like the Gracchi brothers, Marius, Sulla, Pompey, and Caesar. There would be a biography, a physical description, and a discussion of the political intrigue each of them engaged in. A whole cast of supporting characters like Crassus, Cato the Younger, or the Scipioni clan would be introduced and their story given. Here, though, my discussion of these people will be limited. The goal of these episodes, however poorly I've kept to it, is to get us to our starting point of 1 AD. And, so when we get there, we don't look around and ask, where are we? As the Romans destroyed enemy after enemy around the Mediterranean, conflicts became increasingly internal rather than external. The desperation of the common people led some of the elite to take up their cause whether out of genuine concern or political expediency. One of these politicians was Tiberius Gracchus. He came from a wealthy and well-connected plebeian family. His father, of the same name, had served as praetor, tribune, and consul, and had married Cornelia, the daughter of Scipio Africanus, making the younger Tiberius Gracchus a grandson of the legendary Scipio. Tiberius himself had served as an officer in the Third Punic War, his upbringing and experience all pointed to a young man clearly on a trajectory for greatness. In 133, Tiberius was elected Tribune of the Plebs. This is when the trouble began. There was a growing demand among the poor for land redistribution. Anything to fix the growing social crisis facing Rome. Land reform had been proposed in 140 BC by one of the consuls, but the Senate had stubbornly opposed it, and the issue was dropped. Seven years later, Tiberius made himself the people's champion when he reintroduced the reforms. He proposed land reforms to redistribute the agor publicus, public land that had been gained in conquest, which was now meant to be shared, but was presently being monopolized by the rich equestrians and senators. On top of this, there was a law in the books that no one could own more than 120 hectares, or about 300 acres, but the law was routinely ignored. In his Lex Agraria, Tiberius proposed enforcing the size limits of land and splitting up the remainder, along with the agor publicus, and distributing it. The intent of the reforms was to give this land to veteran soldiers and to the urban poor, to mollify them, but also to get them out of the crowded streets of Rome and provide them with enough land for them to qualify for military service. In arguing for reform, Plutarch records Tiberius as saying, the wild animals of Italy have their dens. Each of them has a place of rest and refuge. But those who fight and die for Italy have nothing, nothing except the air and the light. Houseless and homeless, they roam the land with their children and wives. They fight and die to protect the rich and luxurious lifestyles enjoyed by others. These so-called masters of the world have not one clod of earth that they can call their own. The reforms seemed to solve many issues, but of course the wealthy, who would have much of their property and what they considered their property stripped from them, resisted. 
Historically, this resistance would have led to a leader in Tiberius' shoes backing down, and perhaps the Senate would then grant a small change to appease the masses. The trouble came when Tiberius didn't back down. Traditionally, bills were presented to the Senate for approval before being voted on by the Assembly, but this was simply tradition and not an explicit requirement. Tiberius forwent the Senate's approval and presented it directly to the assemblies where it was about to be approved. But the other tribune of the plebs, an ally of the Senate, vetoed it. Tiberius tried several modifications to the bill, but each time it was vetoed, and the veto of a tribune was final. According to Plutarch, Tiberius attempted to bribe the other tribune without success. Finally, in desperation, Tiberius used his own veto to veto every other piece of government action, essentially shutting down the treasury and stopping all government business. Even this failed. Finally, the supporters of Tiberius, including his clients, physically took hold of the other tribune and pulled him out of the assembly while they voted, passing the reforms. This was a shocking violation. A tribune was considered sacrosanct, and any violence against them was an offense against the gods. But the law had passed, and the Senate had to live with it. However, they ensured its implementation went nowhere. The Senate assigned a peasly amount of money to the project, and too few surveyors and supplies were able to be hired to redistribute any significant amounts of land. That same year, in Pergamum, the Greek kingdom in the northwest corner of Anatolia, who had long been an ally of Rome, the king died. Instead of leaving the kingdom to an heir, he granted the entirety to Rome. Pergamum was massively wealthy, and no doubt many leaders of Rome licked their lips at the riches which would soon be flowing in. But, like a pestering fly, Tiberius buzzed with his own proposals. He proposed the money be used to finance the agrarian reforms. This was a step too far. The Senate had the right to direct finances, not a tribune. Tiberius was accused of plotting to use the money to gain more supporters, and perhaps even attempt to make himself king. Further, Tiberius ran for re-election the following year, which again was not explicitly illegal, but it violated all norms and precedent. While votes were being counted for the tribune election, a gang of thugs supporting the senators jumped Tiberius and beat him to death with stones and clubs. His body was thrown into the river whose name he bore, the Tiber. A decade later, Gaius Gracchus, Tiberius' younger brother, followed in his family's footsteps and became tribune of the plebs in 123 BC. He also shadowed his brother by proposing a number of popular reforms to help and provide political access to the common people. He was so popular that, supposedly, although he didn't run for a second term, the tribes spontaneously elected him for a consecutive term. In this second term, his proposals were more radical and included giving citizenship rights to the other Italians. This was vetoed. Another proposal was to transfer arbitration of court cases from the Senate to plebeians. This further stripping of special rights emboldened his enemies. While he was away in North Africa, working on establishing a Roman colony on the site of Carthage, his enemies went to work turning the people against him. When he returned to Rome, someone insulted him and was killed by his supporters. This was just the trigger the Senate needed. In a meeting, the Senate gave full authority to Consul Opimius to kill Gaius. The younger Gracchus and his supporters heard of this and armed themselves fleeing to a temple of Diana. A militia was sent after him, and most of his supporters were killed in the struggle. Gaius himself fled and made it across the Tiber River before being killed. The deaths of the Gracchi brothers mark the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic. Increasingly, violence rather than law would determine the future of the state. The Senate was inflexible to changing conditions, and they were ready to use violence to keep the status quo. So too would their enemies, though. More and more, politics became split between the Optimates, the senatorial faction holding onto the vestiges of power, and the Populares, who tried to redistribute land, power, and opportunity. The questions raised by the Gracchi and the Populares had not been answered. In just a few decades, a war would begin to determine the status of the other Italians, a war that could have been prevented if Gaius's proposal for citizenship had been extended to them. Beginning in 112 BC, Rome and Numidia were at war. 
If you recall from the Punic Wars, Numidia was the kingdom in North Africa just to the west of the Carthaginians. The support of Massinissa, a Numidian king, had been crucial in Scipio Africanus' success against Hannibal in the Second Punic War. Allying with the Romans had been great for Massinissa too. He had consolidated all of Numidia for the first time under his sole rule. He had reigned for several decades as a free ally of Rome. Now, though, Massinissa's son had died and split the kingdom between his two sons and his nephew, Jugurtha. This nephew ruthlessly fought to become the sole ruler of Numidia, employing assassinations and bribes to get his way. Rome was obliged to secure the dead king's will, but Jugurtha's bribes had bought off half the senate. They consistently sided with Jugurtha over the other inheritors despite the injustice of their decisions. The Senate's corruption in these matters was clear to the people. Jugurtha put his cousin's capital of Serta under siege. The city held out and was helped by many Romans within the walls. But the siege was prolonged and supplies ran low. Eventually, Jugurtha's cousin surrendered. But instead of showing mercy, Jugurtha executed him and the Romans who had helped him. The murder of citizens was enough to stoke the Romans into action. War was declared, and an army was sent to North Africa. The army was unable to pin down Jugurtha, though, and the consul was seen as not acting effectively, either due to incompetence or because he too had been bribed. The army allowed itself to be lured by Jugurtha south into the desolate borderlands of the Sahara, and was there defeated by the Numidians. With the defeat, the consul signed a peace deal with Jugurtha, but the Senate wouldn't agree to the terms, and war was continued. Shaken awake by the loss, a more competent general was sent, named Metellus. Metellus was able to defeat Jugurtha's army, but was not able to capture him either. Jugurtha kept retreating, dragging out the war, even fleeing to the Mauritanian kingdom to the west, in modern Morocco. By 107, the assemblies in Rome had had enough of the waiting and they deposed Metellus in favor of his lieutenant, Gaius Marius, who became consul for the first time, but not the last time, in that year. Marius found it difficult to recruit enough soldiers for the army to function. Fewer and fewer people met the property requirements. He instead hired volunteers from the veterans and even from men without property. This wasn't his only army reform. He adjusted the structure of the divisions and made improvements to the Roman javelin. His new army gathered in southern Italy before transporting over to Africa. A man named Lucius Cornelius Sulla was made cavalry commander, although this was against Marius's wishes, as Sulla had a reputation for lax morals. Sulla, though, would prove to be an able commander. As the war continued, it would be Sulla's connections at the court of Mauritania that led to an end to the conflict. The Mauritanian king agreed to hand over Jugurtha, and it would be Sulla who hauled the Numidian back to the Roman camp in chains. Under Roman tradition, since Marius was in command, it was in his honor the triumph would be held. But Sulla and his allies made sure to spread the word on who had really finished off Jugurtha. This stole some of Marius' thunder and cemented a hatred between the two. At the same time as Jugurtha caused trouble in Africa, Rome itself seemed to be under threat from a barbarian horde. Two massive tribes approached from what is now Germany. They were the Teutons and the Cimbri. They came in their covered wagons and were reported to have 300,000 fighting men among them, though that's surely exaggerated. These barbarians were big, tall, strong, and so blonde the Italians said their children had hair colored like old men. Word spread that they intended to cross into Italy. A Roman expedition was sent north to stop them, but was crushed. The Cimbri and Teutons turned west and passed into southern Gaul, where they defeated Roman army after Roman army. Rome was in a panic, haunted by stories of Hannibal and distant remembrances of the Gallic sack of Rome almost 300 years before. But instead of passing into Italy, the Cimbri took a detour, crossed the Pyrenees, and ravaged Hispania. In 102, though, the Cimbri returned to Gaul and made an agreement to enter the fertile land of northern Italy by a different routes at the same time. 
In response to the threat of these barbarians, and with the successes in wrapping up the war in Africa, Marius was given an unprecedented four consecutive consulships, from 104 to 100 BC. Marius implemented his new army model and gathered soldiers, offering pay and promise of land and booty with their victories. An unforeseen effect of these reforms was an increase in loyalty of soldiers to their general rather than to Rome itself. Their prospects were directly tied to the decisions and successes of their general. This development was another ingredient in the pot of civil war. Marius' army drilled relentlessly to get them into fighting shape. They crossed over the Alps and entered southern Gaul, which is now the south of France. There they encountered the mass of the Teutons. The Romans avoided conflict and set up a defensive camp. They endured the taunting of the Teutons who passed by in such numbers that it took six days for the last of the tribe to go past. Finally, Marius and his army struck the rear of the migration and slew thousands of them. The Teutons were crushed and no longer a threat. He rested his army and then crossed back over the Alps into Italy and found the Cimbri by the Po River at the same site as Hannibal's first victory over the Romans in Italy. In a snowy battle, Marius destroyed nearly all of the Cimbri's warriors. Marius was lauded as the new Camillus, a new Romulus, the third founder of Rome. He was elected consul now for the sixth time. This is where the fun ran out for Marius, though. During his sixth consulship, a colleague of his named Saturninus went into an open radical rebellion, taking up arms and trying to violently implement the reforms of the Gracchi. Marius was commanded to put down this rebellion, but it was a tough choice for him. Saturninus had been favorable to Marius' veterans, and he was popular amongst the people. Still, Marius couldn't support open violence against the Senate. Saturninus was hunted down, and he and his followers were killed. Marius now fled to a semi-retirement, slipping out of public life but a seventh consulship awaited him. In the year 91, with all the social issues I have discussed still in place, a member of the aristocracy named Livius Drusus was elected tribune and made three proposals. First, divide more land and give it to the poor. Second, return to the Senate sole rights to act as a jury, but also add 300 members of the equestrian class, the rich businessmen, to the Senate. And third, grant citizenship to all the freemen of Italy. The assembly voted and approved the first two items, but before they could vote on the third, the Senate rejected the first two proposals, and an assassin killed Drusus in his home. Most of the non-Roman Italians now went into revolt. They had been allies of Rome for centuries, but were treated as no more than conquered territory. Even the cities that had remained faithful when Hannibal offered them freedom had little to no representation in the Roman government. Now, seeing their hopes of citizenship destroyed with an assassin's knife, they picked up their own weapons and declared independence. This rebellion is called the Social War. A new capital for the rebel Italians was chosen at Corfinium in central eastern Italy. A senate of 500 members from all of Italy was formed. Only the Umbrians and Etruscans refused to rebel. Now sapped of much of their manpower, the Roman army struggled against the Italians. Marius came out of retirement and coordinated with his old subordinate, Sulla, to defeat the cessationists. When Umbria and the Etruscans looked about to switch sides, Rome satisfied them by granting them citizenship. After another year of war, in 89 BC, the Senate finally offered citizenship to any Italians willing to end their rebellion. One by one, city after city abandoned the cessationists, and the war ended. Central Italy was devastated, with thousands dead on all sides, all for a war that could have been prevented by a little flexibility or foresight from the Senate. In the east, a Greek king named Mithridates began stirring up the other Greeks against Rome. He was the ruler of Pontus, a kingdom in the northeast of Anatolia, along the Black Sea coast. Roman holdings in Anatolia and Macedonia were suddenly in trouble. As consul, Sulla took command of an army and began marching out to make war against Mithridates. However, the populares in the assembly didn't approve of the idea of a conservative optimate like Sulla having the command of the army and inevitably gaining control of the rich plunder from Pontus, 
and gaining the loyalty of the army. So, at the last minute, they stripped him of command and gave it to the now old and fat Marius, who at the time was technically a private citizen with no office to lead an army. Sulla refused to give up control. He could smell the corruption and demagoguery of the decision. His soldiers, too, who were personally loyal to Sulla, were afraid they would now be passed over from looting the riches of the East on campaign. Marius sent tribunes to negotiate, but they were killed by Sulla's men. Instead of leading them east, though, Sulla slowly led his army toward Rome. Approaching Rome with a Roman army was forbidden by law and tradition. It was unprecedented, sacrilege. Marius now took control of the response in the city. Without his army there, he had to hastily gather a militia of gladiators to fight. But when Sulla and his army arrived, they were easily overcome. Marius and his supporters had to flee the city, narrowly escaping capture several times and eventually making it to Africa. Back in Rome, Sulla now called the shots. Although he allowed the apparatus of government to continue, even allowing his opponents to be elected, he began another dangerous precedent. He and his supporters set up proscriptions, orders to kill, for 12 people, including Marius, his family, and his closest supporters. These proscriptions allowed anyone to kill the people named on the list and be rewarded, and it allowed anyone who harbored those named on the list to be killed themselves. This list of 12 would not be the last list, but it would be the shortest. In 87 BC, Sulla had his authority to lead his army against Mithridates confirmed, and he left Rome and headed east. As he left, the two consuls in Rome were Cinna, a radical populare and supporter of Marius, and Octavius, an optimate, and supporter of Sulla. In the absence of Marius and Sulla, these two supporters led their gangs of clients into street battles with each other, with 10,000 killed in one day. Octavius and his gang got the better of the fighting, and Cinna was forced to flee from Rome. Marius returned to Italy now, met up with Cinna, and together they led a force of men into the city and defeated Octavius' street army. He and his men were killed, and Marius had their heads displayed alongside the heads of the senators who had supported them. A revolutionary tribunal was set up, and any patrician who had ever opposed Marius was executed then and there. Their property seized, their bodies not even allowed a proper burial. Sulla's property was seized, and he was stripped of all his commands in absentia and declared an enemy of the state. Cinna was elected consul in 86, as was Marius, for his seventh and final time. But 14 days later, Marius died at the age of 71. A man named Flaccus was elected in his place, and then given control of his own army to take east to deal with Sulla. Cinna was now sole ruler of Rome, and had himself elected consul for four consecutive years. In Greece, Sulla was having success after success against the Greeks who had joined Mithridates. In 86, he crossed over the Hellespont and was about to engage the main Pontic army when Flaccus arrived, and Sulla learned he had been relieved of command. Sulla, though, was able to convince Flaccus to allow him to finish his campaign first. Furious at this, Flaccus's lieutenant, Fimbria, killed Flaccus and declared himself leader of all Roman armies in the east. He then headed north with his army to end Sulla. Sulla quickly made peace with the Pontic king, and then headed south to meet Fimbria in the region of Lydia. Before a battle could occur, loyal supporters of Sulla went out and convinced most of Fimbria's army to desert him and join Sulla. Abandoned by his men, Fimbria committed suicide. Sulla extracted tribute from Greece, and then headed home to Italy. Cinna marched his army out to sail across the Adriatic to meet Sulla before he could reach Italy. But in a mutiny, Cinna's men rebelled and killed him. His path now open, Sulla sailed to Tarentum. There, he met many of his own supporters who had fled Rome to survive Marius's and Cinna's purges. Among these supporters was a man named Crassus, who will play a large role in the coming decades. On his march to Rome, Sulla's veteran army easily defeated two armies sent by Carbo, the consul who now headed the Marian faction, along with Marius's son. These two were both elected as consuls in 82 BC, 
as Sulla and his army, led by Metellus, and a bright young man named Pompey, marched towards Rome. Marius the Younger, though, was able to send word to a praetor to quickly kill any surviving supporter of Sulla. A gathering of the Senate was called, and many of the senators, along with the Pontifex Maximus, were slain. Sulla's army surrounded Rome, and without a fight, the gates were opened, and they were welcomed inside by the people who were sick of the purging. After securing the city, Sulla left again and headed north to Etruria. I have so far understated how much these conflicts had become a general civil war in Italy. Many of the Italian allies had thrown in their lot with Marius' faction and were now at war with Sulla. Of the Italians, the Samnites now lifted up their heads after a couple centuries of relative quiet and fielded a large army in support of the Marians. Small battles took place between Sulla's lieutenants and the Marians throughout Italy, resulting in Carbo having to flee to safety in Africa. In November of 82, a decisive battle took place just outside the Colline gates of Rome. Sulla's forces were away from the city when they received word that a huge Samnite army approached Rome itself. With the city in panic, Sulla force-marched his infantry back toward the city and dispatched his cavalry to slow them down. But the Samnites arrived first. The arrival of the cavalry encouraged the citizens of the city and let the Samnites know Sulla was on his way. The tired soldiers of Sulla, who had just marched many miles, were only given a few hours of rest before the battle began. The Samnites initially got the better of Sulla's army. The left wing commanded by Sulla was pushed back all the way against the city walls, with some trying to flee inside, but the watching citizens shut the gate on them to keep them from breaking. As the day wore on, Sulla tried again and again to rally his disheartened soldiers, with little success. But the wing held together. As evening fell, Crassus approached Sulla and informed him that his right wing of the army was having much more success and was pushing back the Samnites. This news boosted the morale of the left wing and his men rallied. Fighting into the night, Sulla's forces finally pushed the enemy back to their camp, captured their leaders, and won the battle. Marius the Younger, still holed up in a city, besieged by Sulla's men, committed suicide when the city surrendered after hearing the results of the battle. Sulla now controlled Italy and Rome itself. Entering the city after the battle, he made himself dictator. In retaliation for the prescriptions of Marius and to secure his own position, Sulla now implemented a wide range of prescriptions. The killing kept on going. More than 40 senators and 2,600 businessmen, who were key supporters of the Marians, were killed and their property was seized. Among those listed on the prescriptions was a young man named Julius Caesar. But his friends in the sullen camp convinced the dictator to spare him. Sulla supposedly said of the young man, In this Caesar, there are many Mariuses. As dictator, Sulla reformed the government of the Republic to his liking. He increased the number of senators from 300 to 600, packing the body with his supporters. He expanded the assembly as well, giving access to citizens in Gaul and Hispania, which diluted the power of the mostly Italian populares in the body. He made changes to the tribunate, making it a dead-end post. Someone serving as tribune could not in the future serve as consul. This kept men of ambition away from the role. Lastly, he formally instituted the cursus honorum, a succession or ladder of posts that culminated in a consulship with fewer and fewer spots on each higher rung, and with age limits for each role. In the year 80, having secured Rome and cleansing it from Marius' stench, Sulla retired to private life. He walked freely in the city now, able to answer with integrity anyone who questioned him. His purges had rid the city of his enemies. He lived the last two years of his life, fulfilling the name many called him, Sulla the Happy. Before he died in 78, he is recorded as saying, No friend ever served me, and no enemy ever wronged me, whom I have not repaid in full. Marius and Sulla set the stage for the violent fall of the Republic. Their use of force instead of law fractured any illusion of the Republic's strength. In the next episode, the protégés of Marius and Sulla will continue their fight and pull Rome into two decades of civil war. I'll see you next time for the final prologue episode.